Welcome. You are at the Minnesota Achievement Gap Committee Forum entitled, Principles Discuss What It Takes to Beat the Odds. Just for those of you who are new, the Minnesota Achievement Gap was founded eight years ago by Don Frazier, who has always been a proponent of education and is now co-chaired by Don and Grant Abbott. My name is Katherine Page, and I'm also on the committee. I'm a 40-year urban educator and spent my last 10 years as a principal in the Columbia Heights School District at an elementary school where we did succeed in beating the odds. I want to thank the principals for coming today. I know this time of year is a very, very busy time of year. I know they are all busy, though. <laughs> so I want to thank you for coming today, taking time out of your busy schedules. These principals are here because the interim superintendent in Minneapolis, Michael Gore, gave us their names, saying they were great leaders and had successful schools. So congratulations for that. We know that it takes a great leader to have a successful school. Each principal will tell a little bit about themselves, and then they will talk to us about their s school and what they did to be successful. So we're very excited to get started. And when we finish with all four of the principals, then um, Marianne and Sharon and Grant will hand out note cards. Please write your questions on the note cards and then give them back to them. They will give them to me and then I will ask the questions. So we should have about a half an hour for your questions. So thank you very much and we'll get started. Okay. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is LaTanya Daniels, and I'm the principal of Patrick Henry High School in Minneapolis um, Public School District. Um, I'm supposed to share a little bit about myself. Um, this year is my fifth year as the principal of um, Patrick Henry. I've um, um, been on this journey as an educator in the Minneapolis Public School District for approximately, um, I want to say, 15 years. I'm working um, my way through um, Starting out actually as a support professional, um, as an associate educator, moving to become a school success program assistant, then a math teacher, then an instructional coach and mentor, then an intern assistant principal, assistant principal and now principal. So it's been, it's, it's, it's been a journey and it's been a, it's been a great journey. I am um, currently working on my um, doctorate in education at the University of St. Thomas and I'm in my second year there, and that has been a journey as well, to, to juggle it and do that well, as well as be a half-decent um, principal while I'm, while I'm in school. Um, Patrick Henry mm -hmm. is um, located in North Minneapolis, Urban High School. Um, our school population, um, demographics rather, um, we have about 40% of our students are Hmong, 40% of our students are African American. Um, we have 10% of our students that are white, and then we have 10% of our students that are Native American as well as um, Latino. We approximately um, have about 1,080 students, um, and we've held steady at about 1,100 students um, over the last five years um, since I've been been the principal. Um, we, though we are located in North Minneapolis, we refuse to accept the narrative that comes with um, being geographically located in North Minneapolis. Um, and we, if you watch the news, if you read the newspaper, you know what that narrative, that narrative is. And so we do not, um, um, subscribe to that narrative and therefore we approach our work each day um, courageously to beat the odds and um, produce a different narrative out of our out of our school and thus um, we have um, um, three years ago we were a celebration eligible school um, recognized by the state of Minnesota and for the last two years consecutively we have been um, um, a reward school and just last week, we found out that the U.S. News and World Report ranked um, Patrick Henry High School as the number three high school in the state. Yay. So, <laughs> thank you. And it's, it's because we forget that we are located in North Minneapolis. We're going to do what's best for our babies. 
at Patrick Henry. And so that's a little bit about me and my high school. Thank you, Latanya. Mm -hmm. I'm Cindy Miller. I'm principal at Wheat Park Elementary School. It's located in northeast Minneapolis. It borders Columbia Heights and St. Anthony. So um, I, uh, not quite the story of Latanya, but I also came into the district 21 years ago as uh, TOSA and, um, or, or trying to learn how to be a principal and went up to assistant principal and then to principal. And many years ago, when, when I first came in, they believed in moving us around quite frequently so we would have the different experiences. Mm -hmm. I spent 10 years on the north, or, yeah, on the north side. I've, I've been at um, fine arts magnets and all just different kinds of things to give me experiences. I do think it made me uh, a richer person for experiencing a lot of um, different kinds of diversity and um, it was just a great experience. Waite Park uh, has about 483 students. Our makeup is about 35 percent African American about 50 some percent white and then the other population is a combination of Hispanic and, and different uh, uh, makeups. Uh, we, in the, I've been there for five years. In 2013 we were a celebration school. Every year that I've been there um, my team, my teachers and I and community have made a, a significant improvements in our what we call our multiple measure rating mm -hmm. and so the good part about that is they look at more than just is the student proficient they look at growth and are you closing the achievement gap mm -hmm. and so we've made gains in that as I said before in 2013 we were a celebration school in 2014 we were cele uh, celebration eligible again but as you know, many of you know, you have to make application and there's a rubric for that and the competition was very stiff in 2014, mm -hmm. as it always is, I think. And so while we were eligible, we didn't get the official designation. So we also are just taking the child where they are at. We really believe in growth. That's our, of course, we would love, as I said before, to have everyone proficient but our goal is growth. So if you are a gifted student, our goal is for you to make growth. Mm -hmm. If you are not proficient, our, our, our goal is for you to make growth as well, and in between as well. So growth is one of our, our main things that we feel internally that we want to do for, for all students. Thank you. That's great. Great, and my name is Vanita Miller, and I'm principal at Anmont Middle School, and this too was my fifth year. <laughs> and so it's just kind of fun. I didn't know half of the stuff that they're saying about each other, and that's, <laughs> that's what you get when you get such a large district as Minneapolis. Um, you don't really get to learn about each other's schools until you do an event like this, so thank you for that. Um, as I said, this is my fifth year at Anmont Middle School, and we, we don't have the privilege of, uh, of saying that we're, um, oh, I should tell you about myself. Uh, this is, I joined the district um, as a long call reserve teacher back in 1988 and I have been with Minneapolis since then. So I believe this is like my 27th year. I'm going on my 27th year and uh, six years ago um, I dove into being an administrator and then I was um, put in charge of creating Anmont Middle School, kind of a, a fresh start where we combine the um, international baccalaureate program that is there with the middle school of the immersion schools, um, the Spanish dual language immersion schools. So we have about um, a third of our population are in the immersion school and two thirds are IB community school, but all of our students receive an IB education. Mm -hmm. The immersion students take three of their required courses in Spanish. So they are learning science in Spanish, they're learning um, social studies in Spanish and also Spanish language arts. So it's kind of like a little twist on the IB program and the middle years program. So it's just kind of an exciting, um, diverse school. We have um, a federal level three, two federal um, level three programs. One is we call DCD, which is Developmentally and Cognitively Delayed Program. And then um, we have our uh, SPAN program, so a special program for adolescent needs, 
and those are our kids with the emotional um, behavior disorders. And so we work with them into mainstreaming them as many as we can and, um, and just creating a really uh, a, a community where we too believe that everyone can learn and um, we don't think about it as uh, disabilities, just different abilities. Good afternoon, my name is Lorraine rhodes Dix, and I'm the neophyte of the group. Uh, <laughs> I am an assistant principal at Ann Watton with Vanita. Um, coming into education, I tried really hard to not fall into the footsteps of my family heritage, which is 18 teachers, two principals, and one superintendent. <laughs> so I tried my best. At age 30, uh, all the um, professions that I was in um, all called. I, I, I did not feel that need to stay. I kept hearing this tiny voice saying, you know, that's not where you belong. You know you belong in education. And so finally I came into education through an alternative licensure program uh, between um, Anoka Hennepin School District and uh, St. Cloud State. And through Anoka Hennepin School District, I was the um, student teacher for Catherine Page. Catherine Page was my uh, mentor teacher and she gave me all that she had and it gave me a love for education and so I need to say that to Catherine. Thank you so much for all that you've given me over the years. I appreciate it. Um, I'm at Ann Watton Middle School and um, if you know anything about middle school you know that it's a tough road for all students grades six through eight. And this is, again is my first year, and so I'm just learning the ropes. And I again have to say thank you to Vanita Miller for giving me all that she has. They remind me of each other. And so I'm very, very grateful to be here to speak with you about what's going on at the Beat the Odds um, for Ann Watton and what we do to help our kids succeed. Thank you. Wow, okay. So <laughs> at Patrick Henry, we are our flagship program and what's the signature of our school, the brand of our school, is that we are an IB World School. Um, we've been an IB World School for 25 plus years, and um, we were um, one of two um, high schools, Patrick Henry along with Southwest, that actually um, brought IB into the high schools back in the 80s. And if you really dig into the history of Patrick Henry, um, many historians who have previously taught at Patrick Henry and then currently at Patrick Henry will tell you that the IB program, the diploma program at the 11th and 12th grade levels really turned Patrick Henry around at a critical time in the school's um, history. So at Patrick Henry we have the IB World, we're an IB World school and as an IB World school, um, as Benita has mentioned, at the 9th and 10th grade level we have the Middle Years program. And the Middle Years program is a is a framework, and, and I like to think of, think of it as a framework, an equitable framework that provides supports um, for all students to achieve an equitable um, education, to challenge them to be inquirers, um, um, thinkers, um, and, and aspire to um, challenge themselves um, in rigorous courses. And I mean, it goes so much deeper, but it's, it, it, Definitely, that's the starting place. That, that's the foundation of our work at Patrick Henry. And then at the 11th and 12th grade level, we all offer um, several pathways for students. Students can continue at Patrick Henry to pursue um, the IB program through our diploma program, which is our most developed program. That's offered at the 11th and 12th grade levels. They can also choose the career program within the IB program, which provides students an opportunity to pursue a career pathway, experience a career pathway, which at Patrick Henry would be our engineering program and digital media program, um, get that experience. And um, also um, experience the IBDP core, which is the, um, um, which is service um, writing, which in, in language, which you know, the students that are in our IBCP program, they complete a language portfolio. Um, and then also at the 11th and 12th grade level, we offer um, rigorous courses in a la carte fashion, which students can choose to um, go into our, um, our um, liberal arts program in which they can pursue DP courses of their choice, choice 
um, advanced placement courses of their choice or college and schools courses of their choice or just you know no rigorous courses but what we really highly recommend as um, as a school because our vision is to strengthen our um, school through strengthening IB and ensuring that all of our students are exposed to rigorous dual credit programs the expectation is that once a student leaves Patrick Henry in the 12th grade year they have taken two or more dual credit rigorous courses that is the expectation and so um, we have students that explore those options and then we also have students who also choose to um, um, do PSEO and so we do have that, we have AVID, we have um, College Possible, which ensures that our first generation um, college students, students in the 10th grade level, um, they're recruited at the 10th grade level, that they have access to all of the support that they need to be successful to get into college and get through college. And so that's, you know, that's from writing the essays, doing well in the ACT, um, to actually submitting an application. And so College Possible coaches, actually assist our students who are admitted to their cohorts in getting to college and getting through college. And we also have a plethora of other community partners that support us in our work such as um, MCTC's um, TRIO program, um, Upward Bound, um, Hired, and so many other programs that support NAS, Northside Achievement Zone, that support us in um, ensuring that our students um, are supported in being graduates of high school and also being college and career ready. In the elementary setting, um, <coughs> Minneapolis has provided us something called focused instruction. And um, their curriculum guides, their learning targets, they're aligned to the state standards. And so the equitable piece is if you're at Northeast Minneapolis or if you're in South Minneapolis or if you're in North Minneapolis, mm -hmm. all students are exposed to um, the same things. In my school, I allow teachers to take that blueprint, that, that framework, and if they have something that works, that is making gains for all students, they are allowed to take that and, and implement it along with focused instruction. Um, we also were lucky enough to have, for the past few years, a math specialist that works with our fourth and fifth grade students and that takes on all kinds of different hats and so we were happy to have that. My school, while I have 483 students, um, I don't have a, a wealth of extra people in the building, it's, it's myself and um, the teachers and so uh, we rely on, um, this kind of goes to climate, so I don't know if I can delve off. Ms. Page, can I go to climate? I don't know. Can I go to climate, talk about climate just a little bit? Um, in addition to the curriculum, we have something at my school called the Wait Park Way. It's an unofficial term that we have developed over the past five years, and it's a way of treating everyone with dignity and respect. And so if someone moves into my school that might have been a misbehavior in a different school, when they look around, they say, hmm, the other boys and girls are not doing that. Now that's not to say we don't have some students that need some extra support, because we do, we all do. But it's just a, it's a mental framework that every single person in our building and our families have as well when you come into the building. So that climate, that positivity goes along with the focused instruction. And focused instruction is for all the grades right. and all the subjects. And so that's just a couple of the things. Thank you. And then also add, um, and one, I mentioned that we have the IB Middle Years Program and our Immersion Program and our other couple of programs. And um, so some of my, my um, uh, my um, pride, my pride, <laughs> <laughs> the Spanish. Um, the points where I just like, oh, this is what I want to tell you about Anne Watton. We, it's just really about integrating, but it's also, I, my teachers are the experts. They know what really works for kids. They are the ones who are creative. 
and um, IB just really lends itself to that. We have been mm -hmm. re working really hard this year on everybody creating um, the IB units where you start with your essential question and just work your way down there. But it's also about um, creating that um, assessment rubric. And so our whole focus this year through our uh, professional learning communities has been developing those um, rubrics. And then the kid, that lets the kids know this is what, how you can get there. Mm -hmm. And it gives the kids opportunities to, you know what, you didn't meet all the expectations, but you're allowed to go back and try it and improve your project. And so it's always ongoing so that the kids learn that there's always, you can always improve, there's always way to improve. And in our teachers, our teachers are off, so we reflect, and that's a big part of IB, reflecting on your practice, re reflecting on your learning, and um, working with each other to help each other. Uh, it's just, it's, um, it comes to just owning it and taking it, and I'm one, I'm very project-based. We have, History Day, and Mountain becomes like a History Day uh, Mad frenzy, <laughs> madhouse <laughs> frenzy. And it's exciting because we have all our seventh graders and all our eighth graders participate in, participate in History Day. Some of them get to move on to the state competition, and we celebrate that. But we also celebrate um, those kids for maybe this is the first project that they have turned in in their school history because mm -hmm. they get to choose the topic, they get to choose who or what they're gonna study, and it just grabs them, and that just, it's just, it's fun. And we actually have 30 um, eighth graders now on a field trip, overnight field trip, up to the Duluth area through the History Day um, competition. And these are students who didn't make it to state, that they really showed that they were learning, that they were committed. And so we just grab all those opportunities and celebrate the kids achieving because some of our kids have never achieved, have never been successful. And so we really push that with our programming. Another program that we have at Ann Watton is AVID, um, that's Advancement Via Individual Determination. And our teachers become our instructors. Um, our AVID strategies are taught by our AVID teachers to the entire staff. So the strategies that we use in our classrooms are school-wide. Uh, even though it's AVID-based, the school uses the, the planners as well as uh, carrying a binder to keep organizational skills intact so that when you go on to that educational secondary, post-secondary post school, you know exactly what to do, you know exactly what your, um, what your um, level of engagement with studying and study habits and that kind of thing takes you to. So we're looking at all of our teachers doing exactly what they need to help our staff become better instructors across the board with AVID as well. And I think middle schoolers, we are different, and I, as you are a middle school principal, you kind of realize that, wow, you act just like them. And, um, <laughs> and so one of my favorite sayings, which is just really prevalent, and I'm sure you've all heard it, is, um, Ms. Miller, you do too much. And I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And I go, I do, and I have a master's in too and too much. So it's just, it kind of like catches them off guard. But kids, I think at the middle school especially, really need those relationships. And um, they need to know they belong. They need to know you are fair. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, you love them all. And you just take each one where they're at and really try to meet their needs that way. So that's one, another thing we really push is build those relationships, build those relationships. And so we um, have been working really hard at offering advisory every single day and making sure that that's intact for next year. Well, thank you very much. We have some questions now, and uh, feel free to fill out your note cards. The first question is, in Finland, resources are distributed according to the needs of schools facing the greatest challenges. I've heard, super, I've heard interim superintendent Gore has proposed something similar. What is your opinion of this kind of equity approach? If it is instituted, how might it best be implemented to gain the support of parents, teachers, principals, and the public? Um, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, superintendent Gore has worked mm -hmm. with community uh, parents and community for the past year, I believe, um, 
having conversations with communities about that because you can you can tell there's there's those who worry that um, if my school doesn't have uh, EL students or if my school doesn't have a level of free and reduced lunch will will I have or I don't get title one funds how will how will it affect my school if maybe Ms. Daniel's school has 97 percent free and reduced and yet we're always talking about equity so I think from my perspective I'm open we've done pilot schools this past year in addition to all the communication that's continually going on to this day so I'm definitely open to hearing about it I'm curious to see of course how it will affect my school but I have to believe if we're about equity that it it will work out okay that no one particular group will be disadvantaged because another group is given more money so that's my own personal feeling mm -hmm. I think there's going to be growing pains and getting used to the idea and really seeing how it falls out and plays out and um, what I do feel is that the, the Superintendent Gore is, um, he's open to that feedback and open to uh, tweaking or changing and seeing how it would work. So that's, it's, it's kind of hard to judge how, how it's going to play out. So it's nice that we're doing it with some pilot schools and um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what would make a difference in each of your schools for those who are not yet achieving? Would you repeat that question? What would make a difference? What would make a difference in each of your schools for those who are not yet achieving? And I'm assuming those, do you have any plan B? Well, <coughs> one of the things we, do somebody else want to go, go first? Ahead. One of the things we do at my school is there's no one particular way of doing a math problem, for example. We accept multiple ways of doing a math problem. Um, and so when you teach like that and say to, to students, there's more than one way to get the answer. Um, and I do like what Vanita said, what Ms. Miller said about projects. Really going to some project-based um, reports. Uh, I also have a special needs program in my building, um, two classrooms, and I just happened to review one of my students' videos the other day, and and he was he was giving a report, and it's it's just a way um, for them to 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 really. Um, be interested in something and really show their show their best work so um, When I think about that question, what would make a difference for those students who are not achieving currently in our schools? I think um, We need to look at the individual student and determine why the individual student is not being successful I mean we can no longer look at education as this um, um, process that that's you know a mass production um, process you know as, as far as this you know factory um, model we have to begin to look at education very you know individually and so some students you know perform are able to perform um, well with you know what we would typically do what you know what programs and and supports we typically offer at our school but at our school but then there are still individual students that are struggling and so it is my responsibility as the principal and it's the teachers responsibilities um, social workers counselors and psychologists let's dig into the why why is the student being unsuccessful is it a classroom issue if it's a classroom issue um, is it instructional and so where how can this student be successful in the within the classroom and so just just at that level one thing that I, I know that we're looking at next year um, and we, we have some PD um, coming up around it is that you know we know we need to work on differentiation as a, as a school you know how do we meet the varying needs of, of our of our students and not and being very strategic and intentional about how we are programming 
students into, into particular sections of classes because I think it's unfair of, um, t for teachers to be expected to meet all of the varying needs of students when we have not strategically placed students in classes to um, best support the student and best support the teacher in, in meeting the student's needs. That's another whole conversation. Um, and then I think it should be appropriate supports. Um, and when I think about supports, I'm thinking about systems of support that are there for um, teachers, students, um, administration to access to be able to do a child study and determine exactly what the student student needs. So I'm thinking of um, a student support team. I mean, I'm sure some sites have problem solving teams. And then you have a, a list of interventions that you um, actually, you know, prescribe for the student to see, you know, will this make a positive impact on the student's outcome um, from day to day? And if, and if so, then that's what we do. But I, I just think, you know, we have to unpack the why for each student. And um, it's, it, it can be laborious, but that's what it takes. If that's what it takes, that's just what it takes. We have weekly PDPLC meetings in teams and they are required to look at student work and make an analysis of where we go from that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what you said, LaTanya. And then one thing we did this year that sounds so simple, but um, I had read an article in the New York Times about grit, and so we kind of made it our theme this year, perseverance, and I would talk about it on the PA system and we would ask the kids what it meant to them to stick with it, to believe in themselves, to have faith in themselves, to have grit. And we noticed such a difference in my school this year of mm -hmm. kids absolutely trying so hard. Um, and maybe not everybody ended up proficient, but they, they moved from from not being proficient, not does not need to partially proficient, and it was, I really believe, well, it's good teaching, mm -hmm. there's so many things to it, there's no mm -hmm. magic bullet, mm -hmm. but I really believe that, that talking about it and really, them really believing that, that sticking to it really makes mm -hmm. a difference, mm -hmm. that grit, that perseverance. Um, to piggyback off of what the panel has said um, about students not achieving, um, I would also take a step back from actually um, the classroom to uh, relationships. Um, a wise person once told me students won't learn from you if they don't know you care about them. And so in order to have that relationship where the student is able to um, work with you, you need to build a relationship where that student believes that you care and they actually will try their best to do whatever it is that is needed for them to be successful because they have that relationship with you. So not only with the academics and, and going through all of the um, things that are needed in the classroom, I would say learn about that student, go to, um, you know, you do home visits, uh, invest yourself in that child because if you don't think of that child as your child, think about that. If you think of that child as your child, you would do everything you could possibly do mm -hmm. to make sure that that child succeeds. And that's where that relationship piece comes in. You have to build a relationship and let that child know that you care about them, that you care about their success. Thank you. Okay. Um, there is a research definition of beat the odds that Minneapolis used, and Minneapolis used that definition a few years ago. What is the current definition? We say that uh, what is, schools are the center of change. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when we're talking about equitable funding, when we're talking about equitable curriculum across the board, when we're talking about um, getting great teachers and diverse teachers and equity training. Um, I think it's kind of, I think it all goes into that. And of course we, we want to have everybody graduate high school. That's mm -hmm. we, we talk about that even in the elementary level. We have college, college, college. And and what we say is if if you don't want to go to college, that's okay too. If you want to drive a big rig truck 
and be responsible for that. That's okay. But get your education so you are able to make the decision for yourself when you become an adult. But um, w there's, there's really a lot rolled up into that, but I just want my high school and my middle school colleagues to know we talk about it at the elementary level, not just, we don't just Good. wait for you guys to Good. say, okay, now we're gonna counsel mm -hmm. you about going to college because um, we do believe that, that every child has a right to an education. And for sure, what Lorraine said is, we always say, the student doesn't get this year back. If, if we don't make the most of this year, they don't get a do-over. So we really, really try so hard um, to make sure everybody, like, like it was our own child. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, beat the odds means, I just, I have a, I had a young man who uh, left us and is actually at Henry um, <laughs> this year. And he, as a sixth grader, he came in and he was absent maybe half of the school year, um, not getting to school. He was uh, receiving special education services. When he left us in eighth grade, he was getting himself on a public bus from Columbia Heights down to um, our school. He arrived 30 minutes late every single day, but he got there every single day and he um, had just grew as a young man and just took it on. He didn't miss school. He got himself out of special education and he um, ended up, we have a great um, school partner called Project Success and they always do a spring musical. And in the fall he told the people, because they come and do character building um, lessons with our students, he told uh, the person, he goes, how do I become the lead in the play? And we were doing Beauty and the Beast. And he wanted to do um, oh Be the gosh. Beast. Mm. And um, I, uh, first of all, I'm an art nut, so I love when all the kids are performing and everything. But to me, it's just, um, he made a decision, and we supported that decision. Um, he didn't have a lot of parent help. He de decided somehow someone helped him click. And it was at our school. And what, what was that magic thing that just made him decide, I am now going to be the student that I can be? And he became the star of that play. Wow. And he, um, and I cried watching him. <laughs> and I'm still, I could just start bawling right now <laughs> because he made it. And I was the only one there at the play to congratulate him on what a great job as he didn't have family there. And so I told him and I held his hand and I just said, the next stage I want to watch you walk across is the high school one. And you need to invite me because I will be there. And, um, it's just being able to make those connections with the student, and I'll tell you it is later. Yeah, and then, <laughs> no, I know. so you can let me know. Um, but it's it's just those little things. So it's like that he beat the odds, and he's going to beat the odds. And and I told him on that stage, on Saturday when he did his last play, that he was going to walk across that graduation stage. So I planted that seed even more so with him because that's what we do. We give these kids, and I think at middle school, we are working with kids who they walk in and one sixth grader boy is like four feet tall, and the kid next to him is eight feet tall, <laughs> and, and they're all the same age, and, and, and you're just like, wow, he brought his matchbox car, and you know, he brought a hot rod magazine. I mean, you're just dealing with these kids, and just developmentally, they don't know if they're coming or going, and that's what kind of makes them exciting, because you don't know who's coming through that door that day, what kind of experiences they're bringing in. Um, but it's our job, I feel, at the middle school, get them ready for high school. You know, we're getting you ready for high school. We need you to be able to go through high school and just continue in your, you know, in getting that high school graduation, because once you have that diploma, it's just, opportunities are just, you know, bigger and better for you. And um, so we work with that and we work with the kids and we try to figure out how do we support the student? What else do you need? What else can we do for you? to um, help you succeed. And um, it's really sad and, and, and like Lorraine said, you own these kids. I mean, you start, they're mine. And um, on. Mm -hmm. so you, you, you start owning these kids and it's like I want, and when one doesn't succeed, it's just really heartbreaking. It's just, it's really, you just go home and it's like, oh, or, or, or you know, if our scores don't look great, it's like, oh, what else can you do? So it's just, you just never give up there, and there is no, magic potion that's going to make them all, you know, these superstars and everything. But the, you celebrate the 
the little wins and everything. And to me, he was a turnaround student. I beat the odds kid. Good. Thank you. Um, Ms. Daniels has a question. What is the four and five year uh, graduation rate? Great question. Um, this year, we um, beat the odds. And um, our graduation rate um, was 86%. And it tied um, Southwest High School's graduation rate. <laughs> um, we made an 8% jump from um, last year. Our graduation rate was 78%. And um, so we went from 78% to, to 86%. And for us to um, tie graduation rates with Southwest, which we know if you're familiar with Southwest, it's more affluent side of town and more affluent high school. And, and for us, we're at Patrick Henry, 90% and more of my students qualify for free and reduced lunch. And for us to um, achieve the same graduation rate was, was very exciting. Congratulations, that's Thank wonderful. Um, Ms. Hewler, um, how does Wade Park assist, assess beginning kindergarten readers? Beginning kindergarten. Well, we, that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about is early childhood funding, but I realize it's kind of a hot political topic right now. <laughs> but Ms. Daniels and I spoke about a year ago at the National Legislators Conference, and, and I said it then, so I'm not tying it into political. Um, but we have a program for four year olds called High Five and they come a half a day in the morning and a half a day in the afternoon. So really, we work with them when they're four, and then when they get to the five-year-olds, which is kindergarten age, um, there's still, um, I, I don't, the, the right word isn't play, but there's, there's active learning going on still in kindergarten, because you know there's a lot of conversation about how, um, intense kindergarten can be, uh, and, and, it, and it is. I mean, we do have reading and math and science and social studies as well, but um, there's a screening that is done at our district office prior to them coming into um, kindergarten, and so we don't, we don't do that screening. Someone else does the screening for us, and so we just take everybody where they're at and then continue with our focused instruction, our curriculum, and and whatnot, and, and we have other um, services in the building uh, to, to support them as well, so. Thank you, and there's a question about focus instruction, so. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Okay. Um, there's been lots of opposition to focus instruction among some of the rank and file teachers who say that it's too scripted, takes all the creativ creativity out of teaching, requires too much testing. Is there a buy-in on focus instruction to Ooh. by your staff, and how did you achieve that? Well, um, uh, I've been there for five years at, at my school, and I really have a strong relationship with my teachers because I know that um, they really are the ones that are with the students. And so there's a combination of ways, uh, the PDPLC that I mentioned before, they have weekly meetings with their teams, which I am a part of. Um, we talk, you must have the standards, you must have the learning targets, and in many grades there are what we call benchmark assessments. Mm -hmm. Um, that the teachers are required to do with focus instruction, but as I've said, in my school, I allow them to supplement it. If they have something that's tried and true, and I can give you an example, in first grade, um, I have three full-time first grade teachers. We consistently um, do well in first grade. We do something, um, I'll call them Mac and Tab books. Um, they're a series of small readers. We have found that they needed this. Now, um, I, next year, uh, the district has purchased a K-2 piece because they have realized that there is something that, that we could use to supplement. So how did I get there? Just working together, them trusting me, me being transparent, and them knowing that their voice does matter to me, that I do listen to them. Um, I'm open to change. We also have um, 
uh, site council in the school that gives me feedback. Sometimes they give me really excellent feedback and I say, oh, I can really use that information made up of parents and teachers. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, uh, I think the, the hard part with focused instruction is um, not, not implementing, not doing it, but with the recording of the benchmark assessments that is kind of a timely uh, task. And mm -hmm. I think that's the one kind of bugaboo, if you will, uh, with recording the results. And, and one of the other parts would be you record maybe the top five um, uh, questions and you don't, there are A, B, C, you know, multiple choice kinds of questions and so where the student did all their work, showed their work multiple different ways, that is not recorded. So I think some of the pushback, if there is pushback, came from teachers saying, well, um, I'm, we're inputting all the, the, the first five questions, but really if you're looking at it to see how we're doing, you don't have the full picture without the work. Mm -hmm. And so they felt perhaps like it was more a checklist, but, but because we, we just did it because it was asked of us and we just realized that the rest of the piece of the work was pretty valuable to us. And I think as a district, all the teachers realize that it is a equity, you know, a point of equity and allows for that. Um, with uh, being an IAB middle years program, we, the big part of that is developing your units. And, yeah. um, and so our big struggle when it did come was, but what about all my IB units that I've already written and, and the mm -hmm. assessments? And it's pretty intensive work that these teachers do. I mean, mm -hmm. we, they participate in a three-day original training and you know, just to learn that IB philosophy and that's one of three different levels of training. And so what we have worked on in the last couple of years and especially this year through our um, professional learning communities is really, um, and also last year, this, uh, last summer, the district allowed for um, curriculum writing together. So all the IB schools in the district got to um, meet up with each other. So all the English language arts teachers are meeting together and they're looking at the focus, you know, so and the math teachers and science and stuff. So they looked at the focus instruction and what was there. And then they were looking at their units and they worked to really meld those two together and to see how they were because we already have really, we already had good things in place with our IB units and, and then we were given another. So there was a lot of pushback at my school, but it was a matter of let's just talk right. about it and, um, and uh, kind of seeing what you're already, what's in there, what are they having to do, what are they asking you to do, and what units do you already have in place that are meeting those needs? Because the IB units are also based on the standards. So we write the units based on the Minnesota standards. So it's just a matter of kind of melding the two. And I also give my, per my permission um, to staff to you know do what you need to do to make your lessons engaging and fun and what who your students are knowing that we do have to take these benchmark tests and um, you know how are you going to get them there uh, so it's, it's kind of like melding the two so mel and then we have the whole immersion component on it where three of our classes are all taught in Spanish and the focus instruction that is provided doesn't have those Spanish <laughs> it goes to you know, go to the Minnesota Studies book well we don't have that in Spanish how do we use that without compromising our immersion program too. So there was a whole other layer that we got to um, fuss and mess with and we're getting there, we're slowly getting there. Uh, but it's, it's, it allows everybody to kind of be on the same page, but I kind of push my staff to um, move it, combine it with your IB because we are IB first, that's what we are telling our community, that's what they're signing up for when they come to our school, we're an IB immersion program. So uh, that's what we're doing and we kind of merge everything together. Teachers are hardworking people, mm -hmm. just amazing. Another thing that we do, um, I think as a district, um, with the benchmark assessments, um, we had a strategy a, a while ago called Understanding by Design, it's UBD. Uh, you take the benchmark, the teachers themselves take the benchmark assessments so that they know exactly which parts of their unit to hit a little harder or which parts that they can kind of pull off pull off of in order for them to do a great job when it comes to assessing the students and their learning. So that um, students and teachers are all on the same page so that 
backwards planning, understanding by design, using the benchmark assessment to see where they need to go stronger or let out, you know, let off a little bit, uh, helps all teachers, I think, to buy into that focus instruction uh, framework. Okay, another question about kindergarten. My daughter is a kindergarten teacher in Minneapolis. Her class has 30 students. Um, she does an amazing job uh, to meet the needs of each child. Do you see any way of reducing class size in the near future? Um, well, actually, my district uh, did lower class size for kindergarten for this coming school year. We're going to 24. Um, so that's, yeah, that's very exciting for parents have been asking for it as well as teachers felt it was uh, not that you, you, you hit it right on the head. They did a great job, um, but I think they felt like they can do even a better job because kids come in at five at all different developmental levels, all, all different readiness levels. Um, yeah, there's, there's a great difference, and in, in some come in with more skills than others, so, it's, so it is a challenge to work with 30 students in a class. But next year, we're, we're supposed to be at 24, um, and that will be, that would be just lovely. It's wonderful. That was my question, and I, yeah. I, I think I wear it a little bit different. Yeah. She's, she's doing a great job, and she's, she said, how can I meet every single yeah. child? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they have every one of them has yeah. Well, we do have reading core in our building, and so they work with a certain percentage of students as well. We do have some AE support, um, a train, tra you know, someone, actually we have a licensed teacher that's an AE that's working with our kindergarten this year. Um, so she can come in and work with some small groups as under the direction of the teacher as well. So we can do a little bit of grouping. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the best way, but also to differentiate the work for um, uh, example, if they're doing a math, maybe a math, some kind of a math assignment, well, the advanced learner could maybe write the word problem out. Besides just solving the word problem, maybe they could write a short sentence or, or they could, you could have some blanks in there and they could fill in part of the blanks almost like a written response. So there are ways to differentiate right within the, the curriculum and still teach your whole group lesson and then hit the kids where they're at mm -hmm. because we do have a wider range of, mm -hmm. of talent in the classroom. For sure. Um, how do you motivate students to encourage, to engage and care about their own success in education? Um, this ties into um, something that Vanita and, in, in fact, all panelists have hit on. Right now at Patrick Henry, we have um, begun work just, um, not just, but focusing on black male achievement because when we analyzed our data, we saw that um, African American males were, you know, leading our suspensions, um, leading the building in referrals, leading the building in fails, they had the lowest overall GPAs in the building. And so in response to that data, and, and they were over referred to special ed. And so in response to that data, we, we made a, a courageous decision as leaders um, three years, two years ago, to um, set on this, on this journey to improve the achievement of our African American males at Patrick Henry. And um, that has been what it is, a journey. But one thing that we've done, um, to improve outcomes for them is to um, empower them and um, give them um, authentic leadership um, responsibilities at Patrick Henry and opportunities at Patrick Henry. So for this work here, so last year we had a model where we, in, we checked in with our African American males. We had a, a, a black male achievement task force. We identified what goals that we needed to um, strive for and the strategies that we would use to realize our goals. And one of those strategies was to have um, guides check in with um, guides who worked as mentors to check in with our African American males at the ninth grade level. We started at the ninth grade level to support them and see how well they were doing and to ensure that they were indeed do doing well. 
Um, that, that worked um, last year and we tried to duplicate it this year. And um, we, we found that it was not um, um, as effective as we wanted it to be. And so we had an opportunity through teaching and learning to um, um, be a part of an action research or start an action research team around this area that we identified as a, a, an area of need at um, Patrick Henry. And so my, one of my ninth grade teams in um, coordination with our um, math coordinator, data coordinator, and our black male achievement coordinator, and one of my um, behavior deans, they started this task force. And the question that they wanted to, to, to look at is, you know, how well will African American males, you know, rise to the occasion if they're given out the <coughs> leadership opportunities. And so fast forward to last week, last Thursday, we had these ninth grade African American males actually deliver professional development to our teachers about what they need to be successful um, at Patrick Henry. What, you know, and had them be honest. They, and they themselves, each hour, first through um, seventh hour, with the exception, I think, of um, fifth hour, there was a presentation, and it was a presentation delivered by, you know, African American males, a group of African American males, to our teachers, and the, the boys themselves with the support of the adults on the task force, they designed the professional development themselves. And so I had my ninth graders asking me, um, you know, questions about, Ms. Daniels, how do you perceive your students? How, how do you perceive your students perceiving your instruction? Or how do you perceive your students perceiving you as a teacher? And um, they wanted, they asked that question during my session because they wanted the teachers to look through their eyes and describe the experience that they felt like their students were, were having. And what, what came out of my particular session was that they do value relationships. You know, um, they, our students are very relational and, and learning is very personal and so they want to know that um, the teacher and even the principal, principals, the staff that work in the building authentically care about them because they don't care that you know until they know that you care. Mm -hmm. Then so if you hook me and we build a trusting relationship, I will take a risk in your class and um, express when I do not know if you, cre if you created a safe environment for me to take that risk. And, 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 and in creating a safe environment, it is very important to build a trusting relationship. And so that was my experience. So that's to, to, to support that demographic in our building and to increase their, um, increase their achievement. And we are seeing their, their achievement increase. When we started the Black Male Achievement Task Force, the average GPA of um, African American males was a 1.7 at Patrick Henry, so below a 2.0. So they couldn't even get into college possible, which was my concern. Like, you, you can't even, you know, to, to, to be accepted into college possible, you have to have minimally a 2.0 GPA. You can't even get into college possible to get to college because you don't have the, the minimum GPA. And so um, at semester this year, the average GPA is a 1.9. Mm -hmm. And then for our African American males who are um, at the, um, in, in AVID right now, our African American males that are in AVID, the average GPA is a 2.64, which is pretty much on average with the on par with the building's um, GPA. So we are moving in um, the, the right direction, but that's one strategy that we use to truly engage students in basically engineering their own education and engineering their own engagement um, at our school. That's wonderful. There's another question um, in the same line. How do you make sure teachers and staff are culturally competent and agile so that they can better serve students of color? And you did a wonderful job, Ms. Henry. Um, we have an instructional leadership team, I think all of us do, mm -hmm. um, made up of representation of all the teaching grades in the school. And every year I focused, um, it's not just a one shot kind of a deal, mm -hmm. but um, this year we spent a month on equity and I brought in some videos, we had some discussions, we did it over a month's period of time. 
So it's something that um, uh, we do talk about and we do say, we, as I mentioned before, we have a special needs program in my building and, and um, it's primarily African American boys in the program and so we talk about that a lot. What, what do we need to do for them? It's, it's not people we've identified, it's, it's a level three program so they've been identified for, from other mm -hmm. schools. But it's what, what responsibility do, do we have to make sure that they have these college opportunities and, and feel good about themselves. Um, and so we have a dog therapy program, um, which comes in twice a year. And the students work with the dog therapy program and then they put on a performance after um, the two sessions and we invite parents or whoever they want from their family to come. And um, it, it might be a generalization, but for some of these kids, they haven't had a lot of good experience with school. And so this is one time when their parents and guardians or grandparents can come in and just be joyful. And at heart, education should be joyful. Mm -hmm. It should be filled with just joy. And so our unwritten goal at Wade Park is to have fun, even though it's not written in our school improvement <laughs> plan. We really try and put fun, fun into it. Uh, one other just piece that, that I've done for four years, I didn't do it this year, but I did it my first four years, and that's I had a lunch bunch and I had the teachers identify a specific type of student that it didn't have to be just African American, but it might be a particularly quiet student. We had, I had a, several different criteria, and then they would come down to me so I could hear them while they're eating their lunch and talk to them so they were heard, because maybe they didn't speak up in class, but it was a specific mm -hmm. demographic that we were trying to reach. Very nice. I, I think that uh, the, around the question of, around cultural competency, it's, it's very important, it's very important, especially at my school, and it's very important for um, um, students that, that attend um, our school. And it's, it's, it's very uncomfortable. Um, it's very uncomfortable to um, have your, especially, and I'll be per, I'll make this personal, it, it can be uncomfortable even for me as an African American woman to um, ha have to advocate for the lowest achieving students in the building that happen to be African American students. Um, but I'm not advocating for them because um, I'm black. I'm advocating for them because there is a need to, there is a need, and it is screaming from our data. Um, and um, so to get at that, you know, you, again, you go back to, you know, like, what are we doing and what are we not doing? And so we have to, it's critical that we engage our staff in, in, in training year-round around um, cultural competence um, cultural responsiveness and we, we really, we started that work last year in rolling out our work around black male achievement and we've continued it, continued it this year. We hit it real heavy at the beginning of the school year with having professional development around the IDI and I'm blanking on, it's, I think it's the interdevelopmental inventory. Um, mm -hmm. I may be wrong, but it's the IDI. Diversity. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, diversity. yeah. And so it's the IDI and then we also um, had um, professional development, several several series, several series of professional development around the IDI, and then um, one or two professional development sessions around um, a cultural conflict, intercultural conflict, and how do you resolve conflict? You know, when you're coming from different backgrounds. Originally, I'm from the South. I'm from I'm from Mississippi, but I live in Minnesota, nice Minnesota. And so, you know, we approach things, you know, I bring with me my narrative, you know, um, my, my, my stories, my, my experiences, and our staff and students, they bring with them their narrative, their stories, and their experiences. And how when we, 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 we actually come to a dilemma or a problem, how do we work through that problem? We work through that problem based upon how we were raised and how we have typically worked through problems. I, I tend to be very direct in working through problems and P Minnesota nice people tend to be a little bit different in working <laughs> through you know, problems. <laughs> and so, um, you know, but given those different styles, how do I know and accept how you work through problems? 
how do you know and accept how I work through problems and how do we find that compromise to work through issues because ultimately it's what's best for the student or it's what's best for the school. So, you know, it's uncomfortable, but it's, it's necessary in order for us because our, 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 our system has changed, our country has changed. So you, you have to address the elephants in the room in order for us to beat the odds. Uh, we have a question that also falls in this line. Do you incorporate relevant current topics in the curriculum? And that is the um, Baltimore and Ferguson protests, police brutality, and if so, how do you do so? Oh, yeah. We'll start. Okay, go. We'll start. We'll start. Yeah, I yeah, can do it. <laughs> um, at, at, um, middle school is always exciting because you don't know if they're even aware, and then when they're aware, it's like, how much do they really understand? Mm -hmm. And so um, with the last um, Black Lives Matter march that was gathered at uh, Martin Luther King Park um, on that Wednesday, prior to that, I called and made um, a school messenger call to the family saying, if your student's going to participate, and here are, here are the expectations that they won't, it has to be peaceful demonstration, and uh, so I just left that message. And then I called all of my students into the auditorium on Thursday um, prior to Friday's expected march, and, and my message was, you're allowed to understand why you are um, going to maybe walk out of the school, have your conversation with your parents, really understand the issue or what's going on behind it, and, um, and remember that it needs to be peaceful. And that, um, and then I kept my sixth graders, because my sixth graders are just babies to me. It's just like, and I go, I would rather you guys didn't leave the building. <laughs> and I just really, I go, but we can really talk about it. We can do activities here at school. And so as a middle school, I had 150 students leave my middle school on Friday. And um, they, you know, walked down through the middle, you know, through the neighborhood, and we're just like all really nervous and stuff about it. But there was, a lot of the kids didn't understand why they were doing it. They saw it as an opportunity. Well, if I catch that bus and I catch the other one, I'm at the Mall of America, and I'm not going to get marked. You know, I, I can't get in trouble or anything like that. So um, my final message on Thursday to the kids before I let them leave was, I need you to do three things tomorrow if you choose to walk out. I need you to be safe. I need you to have this conversation with your parents so you understand why you would be walking out. And I need you to be respectful. And then um, my, I have a, one of my sixth grade teachers, she's just a dynamo, by the end of Friday, she had a whole two-day advisory PowerPoint question and answer um, ready to go for our advisories on Monday and Tuesday to really have those conversations with the kids so that they understand what it really was about and they understand what is going on and to get them to start thinking about why it is so impactful and why it is such a, a big deal of what's going on. And um, so those conversations were happening in smaller advisory groups where those advisories are based on really building those relationships so you can have those deep and more meaningful conversations. And also our um, social studies teachers always um, start with a CNN news for kids headlines mm -hmm. video and so they watch that and so that kind of starts their classes so they have those conversations with the students. We didn't do too much with it at the elementary level. We also have the CNN news, and some classes do use that. We also have a community collaborative at Waite Park, and um, one of the gentlemen in the club, or, or not in the community collaborative, uh, has a boys group um, of these African American boys, and so they have some rich conversations there. We have also uh, been a part of the Collaborative Action Research Cohort for uh, the Office of Black Male Achievement. So we have a lot of teachers that are involved in that, and we will be starting our action research uh, come fall. But we were proud of our kids um, going out to um, participate in the march. Um, previous to that, we've done groups with students um, where we pull in our um, high flyers, our students who might be a little more naughty than uh, is normal, and we talk to them about current events and things that they can do to get on the right path. 
Um, but we also showed them the Children's March um, that happened with Martin Luther King and the students in um, Alabama. And um, the students were enlightened um, at that point to see that middle school students and teachers as well assisted with the um, civil rights movement. And if you think about it, for our students right now, uh, the Black Lives Matter is their civil rights movement. And allowing them to understand and know what it's all about is empowering them to be the citizens that we know that they will come to be you know, in a very short period of time. So we were very proud of our students for taking part in that. But that's 150 of my babies going out into the street. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> just keep them safe. Yeah. Yeah. Our students participated in the um, Mike Brown um, sit-in. There was a sit-in at Patrick Henry. And they were also, we still, we had a, about approximately 100, 150 students leave that Friday to be a part of the um, rally, the Black Lives Matter rally at Martin Luther King Park. And you know, one of the, you know, as students were, you know, leaving, uh, my building, they were posting signs on the, on the wall, and I had to walk around the building and take the signs down as they posted signs. But some, you know, one of the demands is that, and one of the demands that came from students tied to this um, most recent incident with the young man in Baltimore is cultural response, culturally responsive um, instruction and culturally relevant um, learning. And um, one thing that uh, Minneapolis has done to make sure that students can see themselves, all students can see themselves in the curriculum at the ninth grade level is that um, this year we, I was a part of a task force that revised the graduation um, requirements, the graduation requirements for, for Minneapolis. And so at the ninth grade level, um, students will not take a full year of geography. They will take a, a semester of geography and then they have a choice the, of taking um, an Asian American history class or a black history class, or um, in, in these class, the black history class is the most well-developed class, but eventually they will develop mm -hmm. a, a menu of, you know, um, of those, you know, histories, ethnic history courses for students to, to choose and take in order for them to learn about their cultures and other cultures as well. So that's, that is a step in, in, in the right direction. Very nice. Um, there is a curriculum re related question. Does your school emphasize the arts as necessary for brain development? Uh, STEAM instead of STEM? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, um, um, of, of music, of art, of acting and everything like that, and um, I can't do any of it, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoy it when other people do it. Um, but so we, my, my big thing when I'm always looking for what do we need for, as electives and everything, um, I look into do we have enough band classes and um, music exploration classes and choir and theater, and so I build on that. We also have visual arts, um, and we have a class called design. And that's all part of our IB curriculum, which is great because in um, middle years program, you have to have um, what we call a wheel class or rotation class, and they have to have phi ed slash health, um, art, and then also this design class, and we do it through computer technology. So they're just doing, right now the eighth graders are doing music videos, uh, and you see all these kids with you know cameras walking around the school, and then they present them, and then they actually have an assembly and they show the students what, they've, what work they've done. So I just, I, I think it really does develop the whole person. We have an after school program and so we try to get some dancing in there and also the exercise like some yoga classes. Just kind of looking at that whole child, um, we have different events, family night events um, that sh showcase the arts and showcase what the kids are doing in school. So it's like getting them ready, not necessarily for performance, but for displaying your, your work. Our big one is actually um, always the first Thursday of December, and it's um, called Taste of Van Watten. It's based on the empty bowls where all the profits that we make go towards um, supporting the food shelves that the kids bring in. There's also the band choir concert that evening, but they, um, our seventh graders 
uh, um, make clay bowls and all the money that we get from those clay bowls or donations, you know, they go towards a food shelf. So we just kind of incorporate the whole, the whole student. Um, our, we have a community service team, which is an elective for eighth graders, and these eighth graders, they choose to work with our, our DCD students. And so they're always project-based and community service-based. And they're actually the ones who kind of take this um, Taste of Van Watten event and plan it and coordinate it along with our AVID students. And it's given them those leadership opportunities but it's, it's just incorporating how else can we get the arts project success does that spring musical. Last year we had over 100 students participate. You have your main characters and everything, but everybody gets to be in the choir or they get behind the scenes or doing the, the lighting and the props and the costumes. And so just opening the doors to those students. We now have a community garden in our backyard. <laughs> And um, I don't go back there. That's another thing I can't do. <laughs> and maybe I should go to the school. <laughs> but um, start all over again. But it just gives them an opportunity to, to plant things. And then kids who are in the sixth and seventh graders, they can come back and they um, they get to see you know their products and their produce and, and what you know why planted that and look at this and. We had a great yield last year um, of tomatoes and lettuce and beets and I mean everything. Wow. I couldn't even believe it, and um, and it's just kind of very exciting for the student. So it's just kind of looking at that whole student because there's a place where a kid is going to shine, and if that's the one right yeah. thing that keeps them coming back to school, we can work on the other areas. Um, I opened. A, this is my first year with family consumer science. I brought it back. I had this beautiful kitchen. And so I have kids who are learning just, you know, basic skills, but they're cooking and, and they're going, I go, what are you guys cooking in there? They go, it's taco day. And I was like, wow, what am I going to get And, um, you know, brownie day is even worse oh, because, wow. oh my gosh. Wow. Well, that's like chocolate chip cookies in the oven. So it's just, it's just giving them those skills, but those kids, it's like, well, I have facts, I gotta go to facts. And I go, but you just blew it in two other classes. It's like, okay, you can go to that class. Right. But they're coming for that one class, maybe that one thing mm -hmm. that they have. And um, we also offer the sports and everything, but it's just looking at that whole student because they have so many talents and it's our job to find them. Okay. Thank you. Well, Northeast is the heart of the arts yes. community for sure. We did recently now. write a grant to have um, a guest artist in every room. We did not get the grant, but we still celebrate art in, in my school. We have four specialists in our school and uh, we also have a vibrant uh, community ed program that ha does plays and whatnot after school. Uh, we have an active PTA in, in my school. We're so blessed because they've collaborated with, for example, students and my art teacher and done stained glass um, mm -hmm. work. Uh, we do clay. I mean, there's just any number of things. We, we love the arts. Yeah. Very nice. Um, our last four questions are kind of about organizations working with school and families. The first one is, how do you engage families in your school? In what decisions do you solicit family input? Um, I, I think that's our biggest struggle with our, with our school. Um, but then I look at, um, we don't have a PTA to say. We do have a site council um, that is not representative of our school population. But I go, well, how else are these parents involved? And um, when we do our Taste of Anne Watton, we will get, um, my first year there, we had like a 400 people. And I was like, oh, that's all right. The next year, we made it bigger. We advertised it more. And we got close to 800 people coming to that. To me, they're involved. They took time out of their night to come and see what was going on, see what the hullabaloo was all about. So they came. So I. So we kind of look at it as um, how else are these parents involved? Not the the way we were brought up where you attend your PTA meetings Pitch, and stuff yeah. like that. Parent involvement is not that way. Um, middle school parents are already kind of letting go of their kids and then um, the population we're working with is not that interested in coming to those kind of meetings. But they're interested to see their kids perform. And they're interested to see their kids work. And so we need to, um, we, we kind of grab on that. We call them, we do home visits. Um, she's awesome at the home visits. And uh, the most recent thing is we have some kids who are just not thinking or taking eighth grade um, serious. And so 
it's walking across that stage and getting the eighth grade recognition so we made calls mm -hmm. um, and just asking the parent we really want them to walk across this is what how we need you to support us and they they absolutely absolutely I think we had three or four families come in are you Miss Rose? And it's like, no, she's not here, but I'll come <laughs> talk to you because I know what she was talking about. It's just meeting them that way. And our conferences have gone up. I mean, our attendance at conferences. So I think you have to look at um, family involvement in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, there are actually six levels of family involvement. The first being, um, do you go into your child's backpack? You know, you're supporting the school by at that basic level of going into your child's backpack, asking about different um, things that are going on at school. If you're sitting around the table asking them about what's going on, um, what types of things have they, they learned in school that day, that, that's the first level all the way through to actually being a part of the PTA. So between those two levels, there's four levels that, are, uh, that parents can take advantage of. But that first level, for whatever reason, a lot of people just discount. Um, the second level would be, you know, do you provide a place for your child to do their homework? Uh, and if you can, do you assist them with that homework? So we cannot discount um, parent involvement on those first two levels because a lot of our students, their parents are in survival mode. They have to work, they have to provide for the family, they have to keep a roof over their children's head. But it does not, uh, it does not state that they are not involved because they do that. They are involved, but they're on a different level than what, what most people would consider parent involvement. They are involved. They care about their children as much as anyone. And even at those two basic levels, they are showing parent involvement. So we have to look at parent involvement, like Manita said, a, a little bit differently because our parents are involved. They're just not in the school because they are in survival mode and they work. So we're looking at parent involvement from those standpoints as well. I, I love what you said. We had a new student move into our school this year in fifth grade and, and way behind on all of his homework pieces and we did a home visit and, and his mom said, you know, I can go to the library with him and the library offered a um, quiet place, it offered a computer, it offered tutoring. The student is no longer behind, he's got all his homework turned in and it's a real success story. So I, I so want to support what you just said, mm -hmm. um, the backpack or the homework, because we know that some of the homes, there isn't a quiet place for a student to do the mm -hmm. homework. There's a, there might be a lot of people living in the home and there just simply isn't a quiet place. But if they can take that next step and maybe go to the library with their child, that would just be so amazing. We do all the traditional things that everybody else does, emails, calls, home visits. Um, we happen to be blessed with a very, very active PTA at my school, so I have a lot of parent engagement, and so much, in fact, that PTA has funded for the past years that I've been there a volunteer coordinator position of 10 hours. And that person then I can shoot her an email and say, you know, we're having a taste test in our school on such and such a date. Can you get me a couple of volunteers? Or somebody needs a tutor. Or we need laminating. A whole array of different things. So parents who maybe don't feel like they could be competent to be a tutor, they could maybe come in and do lamination. Or they can do something at home, stuffing envelopes for a mailing, all kinds of ways to get involved. And we've had very good success with that, and um, we're just really lucky that we do have uh, the, the PTA and, and parents that are doing that. Uh, thank you. We ha only have time for one more question, and if we didn't get to your question, I hope that our panel can stay around a few more minutes. Um, the last question that we'll ask today, then, is Minneapolis is moving to community partnership schools. Do your schools intend to apply so that you have autonomy from the central office for instructional and budget decisions? We didn't apply to. <laughs> <laughs> we did not apply to become a community no. partnership school anybody, because, okay. honestly, I already feel like um, we have autonomy mm -hmm. um, as school leaders, and I feel like the new um, theory of action um, continues to 
support um, principals and, and site councils in determining what's best for their school and schools and strategizing around what's best and, and what's needed at the school level. And um, I also feel like um, with the support of our associate superintendents and other leaders at district um, level, um, at the district level, that you know they support us budgetarily to you know make whatever decisions we need to make um, at our school. So Patrick Henry did not apply to become a community partnership school because we feel like we are somewhat in in many ways already autonomous mm -hmm. as a school. Right. Did off the way yeah. park. We did we did not apply. I'm, I'm W would love to follow the progress of, of those schools that did, but I feel very supported. And also, it was kind of a selfish reason, too. I, I didn't really push it with my leadership team mm -hmm. because I am the only person in the building. I don't have a wonderful assistant or principal, <laughs> assistant principal or, or TOSAs or whatnot, so I felt like to take on an additional challenge, while it might turn out to be extremely good, was not something that that um, I w wanted to really take on, and, and I didn't really feel that we we maybe um, were the right setting for that at this time. Okay, very good. Well, thank you again so much for coming out today. It's been highly informative, so we really appreciate it. So thank you. Give them a hand.